uh, class-ridden society. For instance, the Anglican Church tithed 10%, um, both Catholics and Presbyterians, which was one of the things that drove Presbyterians out of Ireland and over here, because you know, being tied by a church you don't belong to, uh, yeah, it's a long way from separation of church and state. So that was one of the great um, sort of fundamental ideas of the American Revolution. We'll never have that over here. You know, so the separation of, of, of church and state has, in many ways, its origins of the tithing that went on. Uh, so you, we mustn't forget that. So you can see how unfair the uh, situation was. Plus, the Irish Parliament. Now, this was before what has what, what as a result of all this became the United Kingdom when they uh, abolished the Irish Parliament in 1800. So there were two separate kingdoms at least in theory, um, and you had two separate parliaments. So you had a parliament in Dublin, um, but it was very much a, a, a token parliament. It met for a couple of months every two years, and the Lord Lieutenant, who represented the Queen, only came over and resided in Ireland while the parliament was in session, and everything had to be approved by the the British Parliament, so it was kind of just almost like a civil servant, a business thing, and the 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 uh, franchise uh, for it was very very limited, uh, and even the new cities, the new uh, the, the 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 new uh, trade class didn't have very much representation. Some cities did; they became chartered cities and boroughs and so on, and they 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 got they were able to have representative. But generally speaking, it was the landed gentry. So it was known in Ireland history as the the landlord's parliament. Um, so the, the old la, la, landed class. So I'm sort of sitting laying out all the different sort of little. Um, uh, elements of this of this story, so to speak, um, and how the American Revolution uh, upset the situation uh, in Ireland. But probably the thing that it's obvious that the American Revolution had reverberations all over the, all over the world, and sp especially in Europe, and in many ways triggered the revolution in in France because um, that it was the American the American experience that gave the French people the courage to think that, yeah, you could overthrow the old system. The ancien régime, ancien régime, say it in French, come on. The ancien régime. Ancien régime, yeah, I love that. <laughs> you know, we can't say that stuff. Anymore. But that's what it was known as, isn't that correct? That's that's what it meant. It meant very much, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. Much and so, Americans Yes, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, until the storming of the Bastille in what, 1791? Two. 71? Uh, 91, I mean. I think it was 91. I think so, 91. Yeah. Was it 91? Thank you. Um, you know, we look back on that now, we think it was like a natural thing to happen, but not really. It was an extraordinary thing to happen, uh, actually, because to overthrow the existing order in any age uh, is, is, seems very unlikely until it happens, and then, oh, yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> so there was a lot of things going on, um, and I'll try, try and... and uh, and cover them as many as uh, as much as I can. Now, once the once the war the the the, um, the war of independence got going, and remember there was a long period in between when uh, America uh, got it got itself settled in as a as a as a, a new republic. It took several years before it had its constitution. We were talking about that earlier tonight. Um, it just somebody didn't sit down one night and write up the constitution, as you know. It took a long, long time. It was a tremendous amount went on there. Um, in the meantime, you had fellows like one of my favorites, John Paul Jones. We everybody held of John, heard of John Paul Jones, um, you know, uh, out there. And one event, which I'll read to you from a little thing here, um, sort of gives you an idea of just the the terror that uh, an American ship cruising unmolested around the Irish in the Irish Sea and around must have sent to the to the British. So uh, and the event that we all remember and in, in, in uh, Ireland and England is um uh where is, you know uh, he um if I could think of, yeah. 
he, um, he actually captured a... Um, oh yeah, HMS Drake. You probably heard this, the Drake. Remember that, right? Um, outside the harbour of Belfast, in plain sight of a large number of the citizens of that city. You know, so <laughs> that was scary. So, uh, and uh, of course, as you know, his ship was called the Ranger. Um, so, uh, that, as he says here, sparked off uh, an explosion of invasion fears and frantic appeals to the Lord Lieutenant for help. <coughs> The Irish Chief Secretary, Richard Hearn, replied to Stuart Burke, the sovereign of Belfast, telling him that all that he could spare for the defence of the city was a few troops of horse and a partial company of invalids. <laughs> now, invalids meant something slightly different then, but nevertheless. Um, so uh, that really was the spark that triggered um, a lot. That was in 1778, by the way. So that triggered a, a series of events which um, actually led to the formation of the Irish Volunteers. Um, and then uh, the Irish Volunteers were, it was a very successful organization in that uh, it, um, it was an effective deterrent against an invasion. They didn't know where the invasion was going to come they suspected more than likely from America because they were conscious. We're not so much now, but they were very conscious that, that, that was, they were their cousins. These were the Irish over there that were stirring up trouble in America. And a great deal of the rhetoric and a lot of the, um, the um, minutes and the debates in the House of Commons at the time, and if you read Edmund Burke and, and, and North and all those people, you'll see that they blame the Irish terribly for that which is great, I love it. I think that's, <laughs> I love when I read that. It was those Irish, those colonial Irish in America that was stirring up all that trouble. So uh, they, um, when, you, when I say, the, of course, the Irish Catholics and the Irish uh, people who were not part of this ascendancy were looking around every cape hoping to see uh, an American ship and an American invasion coming in. So there was tremendous, uh, and by the way, at the time, uh, you'd be surprised to learn that there was a tremendous amount of newspapers in Ireland, even in the small towns. People read papers, and those who didn't read had it read it to them. So uh, it was a great age of the pamphleteer, as you know, from Thomas Paine and so on. Publishing was like the internet. It was just... Um, uh, incredibly powerful, uh, so that we kind of think that tend to think, oh, that's a long time ago, and they were dark, and they didn't know. They were very informed, very informed. So almost everything that was happening in America uh, was almost in real time, and certainly in, in in those days, was being reported and widely understood and known, particularly in the cities and down through the population, down through the uh, the. Um, the country, because they had the canals, and most of the, the, that's why Dublin became so prosperous and built all those beautiful buildings like the, if you've been to Dublin, like the Four Courts and the uh, Custom House and all of the great iconic buildings of Dublin today were all built during that period of trade. But the, it, it was not just in Dublin. Dublin was the gateway. Dublin was the outlet for it. And you had these great canals that spread all the way the, uh, all the way down through prior to the railroads but the canals came well over a hundred years or long the Irish were great for building canals that's where the Irish navy the word nav navy comes from uh, they, they, they built all the navigation uh, channels in England and uh, so therefore working on the navigation channels that's where the word navy came from so uh, we were na great navy so when they did the Erie Canal you know where do you want it dug? <laughs> we, knew, we, we knew about digging, digging canals. But certainly in, in Ireland and England, uh, they had uh, uh, tremendous, which of course had spread from the continent. The Europeans are still to this day a great canal. There's a, canals are extremely important in, in, uh, because that was the, it's so, so cheap to transport heavy material <coughs> uh, on, on water. Because it's so so there, the, canal, the canal barges 
would have been going down to Athlone and down to Cork and went all the various places, you know, on a daily basis, you know, constantly back and forth. So uh, the, 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 it wasn't as, as dark as you might think. And, you know, if you, you, you know how much they wrote in those days. Once the telephone was invented, we had 100 years of darkness where we don't have anything to, you know, we have no idea what people said to it. But we know everything that John Adams said to his wife and all the letters and so on. So there's, you know, we have a tremendous amount of knowledge of what was going on back in those days. Um, but uh, I, I, I say that because not only was there... You had the army situation where it was affecting the military balance, if you like, in England. You had this huge th trade thing, but also the spread of ideas was going right down into the heartland of the, and certainly in in uh, in, in Dublin and Belfast.